Hello Internet! Today I'll talk about discrete time control. I wanted to get into control system topics on the channel and this seemed to be a good place to start. The plan is to work out example systems in detail and kind of build intuition from them. So what is discrete time control and why talk about it? The vast majority of control systems are digital. You have a computer or some embedded processor interacting with the real world. Computers run on a clock signal and use binary operations. So they have finite resolution, they are discrete, both in time and values they can work with. Physical signals, on the other hand, are continuous. You mix these two together and sometimes things get weird. Now discrete time control deals with half of these issues. It considers the sample time-based updates of the computer, but it does not deal with binary values or finite precision. On the boundary between computer and the plant, you have two converters, analog to digital and digital to analog. Sometimes these are part of the microcontroller, sometimes you can think of your sensors and power stages as converters. The point is to convert from digital to physical and back. So let's have a look on these signals and see how they work. The plant is a physical system that behaves in a continuous manner, just like this sine wave. The AD will take samples of this signal at given points in time and convert them to numbers for the computer. Then the computer will do its job, compute new values from the measurement. Then the DA will take these values and create a physical signal accordingly. However, it needs to fill the gaps between clock cycles and it does this by holding the last received value. This is called zero order hold. Then the plant reacts to the output signal and the cycle continues. This is our first example system, the control of an inductor's current via voltage output. This means the plant is just an integrator. The controller is only a proportional gain and everything is ideal, so there is no resistance, we have unlimited supply voltage and so on. These are the equations for this system. For the plant you can write that the derivative of the current is proportional to the voltage. The controller in discrete time is P times the error. The measurement IK equals the current signal evaluated at K times the sample time. The zero order hold means the output voltage is constant as long as it's between sample points and it equals the last available output UK. What we're gonna do is combine these equations to see how the system will behave. First, you can integrate the current from zero. You can do that since the voltage is constant thanks to the zero order hold. This leads to the current increasing linearly with time. Substituting Ts gives you the current at step 1. Extending the pattern, you can generalize for any next step i k plus 1. Let's get the control law into the equation and make a simplifying replacement. This lowercase p will equal Ts times p over L. This gives us the discrete time update equation for the control system. The new value of the current is the previous value plus p times the reference minus the measurement. Here's what the system response looks like with p equals 0.5. The current goes halfway towards the reference every step. It kind of looks like an exponential curve, but remember that these are straight lines between the samples. If you use high gain, say 1.5, you get oscillations. For every step, the control uses 50% too much effort, though it still converges. There's a special case for p equals 1, which is an ideal gain and it converges in a single step. Now let's check the stability while keeping everything symbolic as long as possible. We're going to rearrange this expression a little bit and look at the initial value problem. So the reference r is 0, but the initial current is not 0. If you want, you can turn it around for any constant reference and develop the stability for the error. You can see that the current at any time k will be equal to the initial current times the parameter a to the power of k. What we need is that this expression should not blow up to infinity and that means the absolute value of the parameter a needs to be less than 1. 
Solving for the P gain gives us that P is less than 2 times L over Ts. Here are the response graphs showing how increasing the gain causes the system to go unstable. This was all quite simple, but take a moment to think about what would have happened in continuous time. In continuous time, proportional control of an integrator leads to a simple exponential response. You can tune the gain as high as you want. It will only make the response faster and it will never oscillate. In discrete time, you have limitations for the gain, though the faster you sample, the higher you can go with the gain. Next, uh, let's increase the complexity just a little bit. You see, in our current model, the measurement, processing and output happen in an instant, and that's not realistic. All the components will take some processing time, which causes delay. This partial delay is a bit difficult to handle, so instead consider the system where the peripherals are synchronized, which is not unheard of in actual embedded systems. There are ways to handle partial delay, of course, uh, which I'll get back to in another video. The CPU processing is still delayed, and for each output the DA converter can only use the last available CPU output, and this causes a unit delay. Here's our system diagram with the delay block added before the output. The system equations will change only in the k indices, although instead of delaying the zero order hold, it's better to move it back to the control law. This is how the step response looks like uh, with no delay and with delay. You can see how the error affects the output only the next cycle, and this causes an overshoot and oscillation. Let's derive the stability conditions for this delayed system. The update equation doesn't change much except for the shifted k-1 index in the control law. Just like before, if we look at how the current evolves over time, well, it isn't very helpful. What you need instead is to introduce a state vector for the actual and previous value of the electric current. This way we can put the state update equation into matrix form. The good thing about it is that we get this series expression again with a to the k, except a is now a matrix. Sadly, taking the absolute value element-wise does not work. In this example it would lead to a negative p being acceptable, which is clearly not. Instead, you need to look for the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the matrix A. You can put the eigenvectors Q1 and Q2 in a matrix and the eigenvalues in a diagonal matrix. Let's name these uppercase Q and lambda. Multiplying by Q inverse gives this diagonalized representation of A. Once you start raising A to higher powers, the Qs in the middle pop out and uh, you're left with powers of lambda in the middle. But this means the eigenvalues get raised to the k of power, so to be sure about the stability of the system, the absolute value of all the eigenvalues must be less than 1. I have to mention that not all matrices can be diagonalized like this, uh, you might need to use the Jordan form instead, but the condition for the eigenvalues is general. The only inconvenience is that the eigenvalues tend to be complex, so you need to take the complex absolute value. This means that the eigenvalues must lie inside the unit circle on the complex plane. So, for example, these are stable and these are not. Let's go ahead and calculate the eigenvalues for our system. The characteristic equation is uh, lambda times lambda minus 1 minus minus p. This simplifies to lambda squared minus lambda plus p. We can use the quadratic formula to find the roots and look at the two cases for real and imaginary roots. The dividing condition is at p equals 0 0.25. Under that it's real, over that it's complex. On the real side, it leads to p being larger than 0. On the imaginary side, it leads to square root of p being less than 1, which means p is less than 1. Final result? 
P is between 0 and 1. You can also see that the magnitude of lambda will be the smallest when the whole thing in the square root is 0, which is at P equals 0 0.25. Here are the response graphs of the delayed system with different gains. I made a summary table of our examples today. In continuous time you can make the system as fast as you want and there's no upper limit on the gain. In discrete time, just by using sampled control you impose an upper limit on the gain. There is an ideal gain that drives the system to the reference in a single step. But if you introduce a unit delay, you lose half of your available gain. What was ideal without delay is now borderline unstable, and the theoretical ideal gain yields a response time of about 6 or 7 steps. So you need to be careful when implementing discrete time control, you need to look out for unit delays in your software architecture. But you can also see that speeding up the sampling rate alleviates these issues. Well, that's what I had for you today. In the next videos I'll work out first and second order systems more or less the same way as this one. So subscribe if you don't want to miss it. And thanks for watching, bye.